Welcome to part five, which is the last episode in this algebra series specifically designed for elementary teachers or primary school teachers as we call them here in Australia. In this episode, we'll dive deep into the second big idea of algebra, which is called functions. And we'll explore input and output tables, where given a rule, you can generate an output number, or you can backtrack the rule to generate the input number. We'll also have the opportunity to study data or even pictures to generalize or identify a rule or function as we call it. And then from these input output tables, we'll generate ordered pairs and we'll look at how we can then graph the data. Before we get started, I should say that if you are new to this series on algebra, I highly recommend you go back and look at least briefly at some of the other episodes. You need to see how I developed a working definition of algebra, which is using quantities, symbols and rules to describe and analyse patterns and relationships. You also have to have a working understanding of that other big idea in algebra, which is equivalence and equations. And you need to understand the difference between static and active problems. In short, static problems focus on balance and equality, whereas active problems really focus on change. And that's where the idea of function begins. Let's take a look at a very simple addition problem that involves a function or a change. Mia has $10. Her mother gives her another $5. How much money does she have now? This is basic addition, but as you can see, it involves an action of sorts that can be reversed. In this way, functions are useful for building a connection between inverse operations. In this problem, subtraction will undo addition and vice versa. Back in my early teaching days, I introduced the idea of function using a very large cardboard box say one that looked like or one that a dishwasher might be purchasing. I removed the bottom of the box and I had my students stick smaller boxes on the outside and they painted it to look like a machine. Then I cut a slot up high on one side which took the input numbers printed on cards and another slot down low on the other side which was for output numbers. Then I would place the box over a volunteer who then became the brain of the function machine. For example, young students could be a plus five machine. Other students would take turns inserting the input numbers to which the machine, or child, added five before pushing out the output number for all to see. It was a great way to introduce functions and the students scrambled to become the thinking machine. Next, you can move to pictures of function machines. This example from Origo Education's Think Tank series involves multiplication, specifically doubling using input numbers to generate output numbers that you would expect students to be able to solve mentally. In the last two problems, students halve as they backtrack the rules. Now let's explore a sequence of the same function. Look at these triangles. What type of triangles are they? And how do you know? They are equilateral triangles because we can see that each triangle has the same length sides. In this particular case, they are toothpicks. Now imagine you keep the pattern going. Let's complete this table to show what we see. In the first shape, the length of each side of the triangle is one toothpick. So the total number of toothpicks is three. The second triangle has a side length of two toothpicks, so we can enter the total number of toothpicks as being six. And the third triangle has three toothpicks along the side and a total number of nine toothpicks. The picture is helpful as it shows us that the position of each triangle in the sequence matches the number of toothpicks along one side. So the fourth triangle would have four toothpicks along one side. The fifth would have five along one side and so on. Now let's study the pattern of the first three shapes to see if we can identify a rule. 
To do that, we look at each column in the table. It looks like that the total number of toothpicks is three times the number of toothpicks along one side, which makes sense because these are equilateral triangles. Now let's apply the rule to complete the table for the other shapes. We can simply extend the sequence of multiples of three along the bottom row, but this is only helpful for determining the next output number in the sequence. By identifying and applying a rule, we can use it to determine the output data for any triangle in the sequence. For example, suppose we want to find the data for the 20th triangle. The 20th triangle has 20 toothpicks along one side. When you apply the rule of multiply by three, you know that there are 60 toothpicks altogether in that 20th triangle. But you could also ask, what is the position of the triangle that has 30 toothpicks? To answer this, we have to backtrack that multiply by three rule. So 30 divided by three is 10. The length of one side of that triangle has 10 toothpicks. Therefore, the position of that triangle within the sequence is 10. It is the 10th triangle. From this input-output table, we can now generate a list of ordered pairs. Reading the columns, we can see 1 and 3, 2 and 6, 3 and 9, and so on. Having created the ordered pairs, we can now plot these points on a graph like this, where the input number can be found on the x-axis and the output number is on the y-axis. And I've provided a copy of this activity which you can download in the links below. Now let's take this to the next level by exploring a rule that involves more than one operation. Take a look at this sequence of squares and imagine you keep it going. Let's complete this table to show the matching data. The first image has one square made of four toothpicks. The second image has two squares, but only seven toothpicks. Why? You can see that two squares share one side. So you can't simply multiply the number of squares by four to figure out the total number of squares. Let's look at the third image. There are three squares. Three times four is 12. But when you count the toothpicks, there are only 10. The picture helps us see that two sides are being shared in this image, which means we need two fewer toothpicks than 12. What do you suppose the next image would have? It would have four squares. Four by four is 16. But if they share three sides, then only 13 toothpicks would be needed. Following this pattern, the remainder of the table would look like this. If asked to write a rule in their own words, your students might do something like this. The total number of toothpicks is equal to the position of the square times four, subtract one less than the position. And this works for every picture after the first one. Let's try it for the third image. The position of that image is three. So working the brackets first, three subtract one is two. So the total number of toothpicks is equal to three times four, which is 12, and 12 subtract two, which equals 10. That seems to work. There might be other rules too. So don't be fast to dismiss rules that don't match the one I've just given you. I would be encouraging students to check each other's rules against many images in a sequence to make sure they work or they don't. Now, I provided this activity for you so you can print it off from the links below. So this is what I want you to do. One, remember that active problems provide the context for exploring the second big idea of algebra, which is functions. Two, provide problems where students are given a rule and can generate an output number or reverse a rule to generate the input number. Three, Use patterns like those toothpick pictures to help students see the rule and apply the rule to generate the input and output numbers. 
And finally, as we close out this series, I wanna thank you for watching. And if you've seen value, then like, share, and subscribe today so you never miss another learning opportunity with me. See you next time.